Thank you very much for this uh, um, and for reminding me that I'm old. <laughs> Uh, Mr. President, it's an honor to be here, uh, and also Mr. Director General, uh, dear students and the colleagues who are here. Um, it's very nice to know that this is the first time we are doing, I mean, even for us, physical uh, meeting, actually. So we are going to talk instead of only talking over Zoom and talking online. Um, and, um, you know, thank you for giving us the opportunity to talk about United Arab Emirates. Uh, this is a special year for us. Uh, we are celebrating this year our 50th anniversary. So we are 50 year old country. I always say I'm older than my own country actually. So it's quite interesting and um, um, I'll be honored. It will be my pleasure of course to take you through um, the journey of United Arab Emirates um, you know, during to uh, today's presentation. Uh, as I talk, I would like you to keep in mind three words that I think are really representative of United Arab Emirates. Um, vision, um, uh, tolerance is the second, and ambition. So keep that uh, in back of your mind and as we go through it and see if these really come. And th these three words really summarize, I would say, United Arab Emirates uh, for me. So if you like, uh, we'll go through the presentation. Um, again, it might be very long, so if you think that it's taking too long, stop me and uh, we can have a chat uh, and see how we can take it from there. So, I'll be talking about uh, before the union, you know, the past, if you will, uh, which is not too long ago. Uh, then we talk about the years that we really got to grow up from 1970s to 2000 the new century and the areas that we think are very important for us and that we focused on up to today. Uh, we talk about tolerance, women empowerment, very important point, humanitarian aid and sustainability. And then maybe we have, uh, you know, the, the vision that we have for the future. We can discuss that there. So UAE basically, um, you know, I'm sure you all know about United Arab Emirates. Uh, you've, you've, you've read about it and you hear about it. It's a federal system. A lot of people think actually UAE is, is a kingdom and we have a king. We do not, we have a president of United Arab Emirates. It's a, it's a federation of seven states, seven emirates uh, that have come together uh, in this, on December 2nd, 1971. That's when UAE was formed. Before that, we were um, what used to be called trucial states and um, under the protection of Britain. British Empire at that time. So uh, let's go through this and just to say that this is where we are going to start the journey. And this is a very interesting picture. As you can see, we have a lot of desert. And, uh, and this is a beautiful area in Abu Dhabi where you have sand dunes of over 100 meters. Beautiful place to, to, to climb or to try and climb. Now, this picture I wanted to show you because this is not that long ago. Uh, probably in Europe you would say this was maybe in 1700s or 18th century or something like that. This is really actually, you know, 50 years ago or 50 to 60 years ago only. And uh, this is how we used to live and we were very close, especially when it comes to the coastal areas. Today people, when they look at United Arab Emir Emirates, they talk about Burj Khalifa, the tallest tower in the world or the Louvre in Abu Dhabi and the, the best airlines and all this. But this is how we was, and, and this is when, where I grew actually. So, so I remember every single place of, of this. And the houses used to be very minimal. Actually, we didn't even have uh, fresh drinking water. As you know, we don't have much of that. Even today, actually, we don't have, but we do desalination. Those days, we used to bring uh, underground water in tank barrels, on, on donkeys, they used to deliver, you know, once a week to our homes. And uh, that was very precious for us, the water at that time. Very interesting. So people, you know, United Arab Emirates, of course, today is very, pro you know, uh, prosper and uh, doing quite well. But just 50 years ago, it was, you know, very harsh environment and we were very poor, actually. So it's very interesting to see the, the change that has happened. 
Um, showing some pictures here, I just wanted to, you know, to represent. And uh, basically, uh, as you can see, the diver, we used to dive for pearls. Very true. That was our biggest uh, industry. And of course, that didn't last very long because after the 1930s, the Japanese started having artificial pearls and it killed our market. And we suffered a lot actually after that. And, uh, but uh, we were fortunate that uh, by late 50s and in 60s, we started getting, you know, finding oil, discovering oil and exporting that. And that of course made a major change. But up to then, it was very difficult. And the picture on the right corner there is of Dubai in 1970s. As you can see, not many roads, uh, totally different than what you see today uh, of Dubai. So very, you know, indicative. Um, the formation of the country was uh, in 1971, December 2nd. Uh, this is the founding fathers, if you will. And I would like to stop a little bit uh, with the founder of our nation, late Sheikh Zayed, who really, I say, um, he had very limited education, of course. I mean, there were no schools when he was, you know, young in, uh, you know, early 1918 and all. And, um, but he learned from, from the desert. Uh, and in our part of the world, in the Arabian Peninsula, you know, from time to time, you get this wisdom of the desert. And that is the place that you have all the prophets that came from. So this is the wisdom that people got. And uh, we were fortunate to have uh, Sheikh Zayed who had that wisdom and who was, who really built this country that we have today, to be honest. I mean, it's amazing character, amazing person. Uh, I would put him like Nelson Mandela, like the others who really have big pictures, you know, look into the future. And uh, he's the one who got all these seven states, if you will, each one was independent together. And he was wise enough to allow a federal system. And in our part of the world, I mean, I think a lot of people I see from, probably are from our part of the world. Um, leaders are very strong. You know, you have these strong egos. Everybody wants to be the king of everything and control everything. He was very wise. He said, I will not do that. I will have each emirate or each state to be ruling its own, to be autonomous. Something similar to what Germany is, right? The federal system. But then we can come together as one country so we can stay uh, powerful, if you will, you know, together. So th that system works so well. And I always say the best example of Arab unity is United Arab Emirates. For more than 50 years now, we are united. Uh, very, very rare unity to find in our part of the world. And that is because of the wisdom and the vision that uh, Sheikh Zayed had. So maybe if you have later questions, we can definitely talk about that also. And of course, that is when we got our oil, uh, you know, the boom started. Now, again, this is important because Unfortunately, in our part of the world, you get some selfish maybe leaders, you know, let's say, let's put it that way, who try to uh, take the resources, but not to, to give the benefits back to the, the country. What UAE did from day one, Sheikh Zayed, he said that for every dollar that I'm going to spend, I'm going to save another dollar for the future. And that is how United Arab Emirates has one of the biggest sovereign wealth funds in the world you know, ADIA, uh, Abu Dhabi Investment Authority. Now, it's not, I mean, you, you might say that, yeah, that is fine because we got oil, we got resource, right? But many countries in our part of the world had also oil, had the resources. But what happened to them? So that is very important. I think it's, it's good to, to look into that. And that is, again, because of the vision that he had uh, to care for the future generations. And that is how we started. Another area that he focused on was education. And I would say I'm a result of that, of that education that started, you know, many years ago in our country when we, we did. And when he did the education, he didn't just focus on, on the men, let's say, on the boys. You know, he didn't just open schools for the boys. First thing he did, he opened schools for boys and girls at the same time. So we got a chance to go to school. Um, I can tell you a lot of stories because, as I said, I lived there uh, at that time. 
We used to have uh, illiteracy was one of the highest probably in the region or maybe in the world also in UAE when we first formed. Right now, it's one of the, the, the best literate countries. And that is because there was a national drive towards education. And he realized all these main points. That's where, where I was talking about the vision. You know, not being selfish, looking after the people, but focusing also on the future from today. So he started the schools from day one. He invested in that. And this is a country that has invested in its future. And we come to the other points also, the tolerance as we go on through the, the presentation. And you know, because I love mountains, as you rightly said, uh, Mr. Dumfried, <laughs> this is a quote from him. He said, we are like those who had climbed mountain and reached to the top. When we looked down, we wanted to go even higher to realize our goals. Despite all the achievements that we've done, we still have an ambition for more. That is how you know, he was looking for his, his people. And this is in Ras al Khaimah, it's one of the states in, in, in uh, so actually we do have mountains in my country. Of course, quite a nice place. Uh, good. <laughs> so, coming to now, the years between 1971 to 2000, for us, it's the years of learning, of growing up, because we were, we were getting to know new things. Uh, going to school, sending people, opening new companies, um, you know, doing the infrastructure projects, opening up to the world even more. And, um, you know, I would say the story of countries, it's like stories of families or, or, you know, communities. You know, we have, or individuals even. So you make mistakes during the time also, as you are growing up. And we did maybe some mistakes and all, but you know, it's good now that we are talking about this because even this 50 years, we are actually taking stock of what we have achieved so far and what mistakes we have made, and we are trying to, to change that. So this is a country, my country is a country that will not say I did not do any mistakes. It's we have, well, I think everybody, you know, well, as we know, but it's good to say, let's find out on how we can you know, change, how we can do better. So on many sectors. And I think during that discussion, we can talk about some of those if you like. Um, this, you know, this is it. Now from 2000, the new century was when really UAE took off, I would say, where we became more confident, where we became more confident even in our foreign policy, you know, opening up missions around the world, getting to know the world better, uh, and participating and being a member of the global community. And that is very important because um, with our resources and all, we could have stayed ourselves, you know, building whatever we want and, and you know, maybe closed our country to, to the world if we wanted. But we realized that we have a duty and a responsibility to the world also. So the responsibility comes to sustainability, to use usage of resources, of oil, uh, but also to being a role model and a positive contributor to the world when it comes to tolerance, accepting the others. Well, you know from, I mean, UAE now has over 9 million people as population. Over 80% of them are, f are from all over the world, 85%. So the UAE citizens, we are minority in our own country. We have people from more than 200 nationalities, different nationalities and backgrounds living in United Arab Emirates. And it's a very stable, safe area. Um, people say that, you know, some people say the best way for, you know, countries like maybe India and Pakistan who had wars together to, to become friends is in Dubai. And that is, that is how it is because, you know, everybody is, uh, and that is because it's important, it's accepting the others. It's providing the environment for others to grow, to give the opportunities. You know, we are not very much an ideological country, and that is very important. We are open to all ideas, to all backgrounds, and that has made us maybe successful in that way. So we have, of course, uh, one of the biggest things that is going to happen this year uh, talking about us doing this meeting physically. In October this year, we'll have the Expo 2020 in Dubai. And uh, over 190 countries actually are going to participate. 
And uh, that is, um, so Germany has a very big pavilion. Germany actually has two pavilions, one for Germany, one for Baden-Württemberg. Uh, yeah, so this is Germany, <laughs> this is interesting. So actually, but it will be the first time that countries from all over the world are going to come together. And, uh, and of course, there'll be challenges of Corona. We know that. But so far, all the countries are finishing off their pavilions and getting ready for the world opening up. And Dubai is going to be the, the center for that. If you want. Um, talking about culture and you know, accepting the others, the title of tolerance is very important. And we don't just say it, but we live it, actually. Uh, I can show you examples of it. Here, these are examples of uh, houses of worship, if you will. You know? The main thing about cultural intolerance is accepting the other and in their thoughts, in their ideas, in their beliefs. I cannot dictate one belief to the others. And this is really what UAE is doing. We have almost close to 50 churches in UAE. Uh, we, have the, we are going to have the biggest Hindu temple in, United Arab, in the Middle East, actually, in Abu Dhabi. Um, I'll show you another. The next slide will be very interesting also. But, uh, and we even had 2019 as year of tolerance. Now, why do we do that? You know, symbolizing a year with a title. It's important because we make everybody work towards that. So tolerance, really, and accepting the other became an important title for all of us. We even have a ministry uh, of tolerance. So that the government, the institutions of the government have this. And it goes into our laws. We have a law against discrimination, against uh, race or background or belief and all. So we cannot do that. Even if I am, let's say, a Muslim, I can never, never, you know, saying, oh, I'm in UAE, it's a Muslim country. I can never say anything wrong about somebody else's uh, religion because that person can take me to court. And this is having rule of law. So there's, once you have a system, you have the institutions in place, things become easier, you know? But you need to build those, and it takes time and effort to do that. And UAE has been doing that. Of course, we had historical papal visit. It was in 2018. Pope Francis visited uh, UAE, and he had a sermon of all, o over 150,000 people from all over the world came to Abu Dhabi, open air sermon that he delivered. And there was even the document of human fraternity actually uh, signed between the Al-Azhar, if you know Al-Azhar is the main center of Islam, let's say in, in Egypt, the head of that with the Pope Francis in Abu Dhabi. Now, being part of the culture and the heritage, it's being responsible member in the world. And UAE has worked, is working with the UNESCO to refurbish, restore the a very important historical mosque in Al Musal in Iraq. It's an 800 year old mosque that was destroyed by ISIS. UAE has been giving the funding to restore it, and it's almost finished now. It's called Al Masjid al Nuri, it's famous uh, historically for us. And that is part of the responsibility that UAE is taking in being part of the global community. And this is where the cultural, uh, I guess, diplomacy comes in. You just don't do only for your country. You become part of the whole world, actually. You become a member, active member to the world. Um, this is a project that is coming up. By next year, we'll have it ready. It's the Abrahamic Accord. Uh, it's going to be in Abu Dhabi, where you are going to have a mosque, uh, a synagogue, and a church together in one courtyard. Again, it's a message of saying, you can have your beliefs, your backgrounds, but let's come together and share it and exchange this knowledge together and respect each other's background. And that has been always a theme that is continuing in UAE. Even when I was small, I used to have, we used to learn, you know, I speak Hindi, for instance, a little bit, or Farsi, because we used to grow up in a, in a community where you had people from India, from uh, Iran, from different parts of the, the world living there. You know, and, and we keep on building that. So it's been always like that. We've been always open to, to others. Um, and I'm sure you've, you've seen this uh, 
last year, just uh, less than a year ago, United Arab Emirates and Israel normalized their relations. This has been a very uh, controversial, maybe for some, uh, I think, uh, a move, but it fits very well with the vision of United Arab Emirates. You cannot be tolerant and accepting everyone and saying, no, I will not talk to this, this country for 70 years or something. Now, we feel, I mean, we can talk this again, this becomes politics now, but we can talk about it later on if you like. But we feel that the best way to come to solutions is to sit at the table and talk and let's come to a solution. Unfortunately, unfortunately, in our part of the world, we are a region, I call it, of missed opportunities. A lot of opportunities you miss by not taking the courageous step to say, let's, let's sit together and let's find a solution. Maybe peace can bring a better solution than fighting that uh, has never stopped, you know, that is going on for over 70 years and has led to more suffering, I would say, for the Palestinians than anyone else. So maybe, maybe this is another channel. Let's find out. And that's why I said United Arab Emirates is very pragmatic. The way we have developed and created our country and built it, we, we could do that for the region. I mean, we, we have to look at it in that way. I cannot just say just because you think different, I'm not going to talk to you. Let us discuss. Maybe we can find a solution together. So that's another point. Going to woman empowerment, again, as I said, this has been always a very important part of uh, UAE. It's one of our major areas that we have focused on from day one. That's, that has given us an advantage, I would say, in a region where maybe women were a little bit more sur suppressed. Uh, Sheikh Zayed, the founder, he said that the woman is half of the society. Any country which pursues development should not leave her in poverty or illiteracy. This is where the school starts. And this is, again, the wisdom that I'm talking about. I am on the woman's side. I always say this in order to uphold her right to work and participate in building the process of her country. So, you know, Sheikh Zayed, the founder, always was convinced about the importance of the participation of women. But this is something that is not that strange in our part of the world. Unfortunately, people think it's not like that. You know, even during the early days of Islam, let's say, Prophet Muhammad uh, himself, his wife, the first, first wife, was actually a businesswoman. You know, so, so it was always like that. And but with time, things changed and the stereotypes built up. But what Sheikh Zayed did is, is really what he thought is the best. You cannot have a society without paralyzing uh, half of it. Um, so it's in, in our constitution. We already have in our constitution that there are equal rights between uh, the genders. Uh, this is not clear. Yeah. Again, uh, when we come to this, we have um, uh, we have many laws that we bring in. It's very important to, to have regulation that helps. Uh, we have a regulation that says there is equal pay for equal work. I mean, that is maybe very normal in the West. But in our part of the world, this is something really unique, you know, and we have put it into the system. So if I'm an ambassador for the job that I'm doing, even if this is uh, in a company, for the same job, I should get the same salary like uh, a male. Uh, very interesting. Um, this is just examples of women uh, in UAE, my country. Uh, on the left, you can see uh, our minister, the young lady. She's a minister of state for advanced technology, and she's the head of our space agency. Actually, she was the one who was in charge of sending the probe uh, from UAE, the Hope probe that went to Mars. And uh, UAE has been one of only five countries in the world that has sent uh, a satellite, let's say, a probe to Mars. And it's now orbiting Mars, and it's getting information, especially scientific information about climate there. Uh, and she's been the one who's been spearheading this. Very interesting. We have many examples, you know. So uh, even when it comes to to sports, not just mountain, but uh, it, this one is tough. I don't think I can do this, but it is there. <laughs> so uh, quota for women, again, very important in boards. And I think this has been a discussion that goes on even in Europe and in, in America, I think people are talking about 
representation of women in boards in private sectors and all. We have made it sure that at least one woman should be in, in all the boards of private companies, but in, in public companies even more. Um, you know, uh, the other thing is, uh, you know, of course, you and women. Again, this comes to our public uh, diplomacy or cultural diplomacy. UAE has been a very active member working with UN women, and we have even a chapter of it, uh, an office of UN women in uh, Abu Dhabi. Uh, we've donated, you know, millions, and we are making sure that there are programs that are going on. Uh, there is one with World Bank, uh, you know, so women entrepreneurs initiative that is going on. Peacekeeping, uh, these are, you know, UAE women who are getting training, uh, making sure that they can be part of that um, also. So quite interesting. We are doing a lot of things, if you will. I mean, I, I can go on and on, but, uh, you know, we will never finish. Um, yeah, so Federal National Council, our uh, parliament, 50% of them are women. Now, this didn't come naturally, of course, but this is where the government intervenes positively, I would say. Because if you want to leave women to become, let's talk about even Germany or anywhere else, I, I don't want to put example of countries, somebody said it will take 100 years for women to become 50% of a parliament in that country, if we leave it as it is right now, situation. So what do you do? You need to intervene sometimes, but intervene on a positive side. I am more of a market-oriented person, you know, I don't like quotas and all, but sometimes it's important to put these quotas when governments do that, just to at least encourage women to participate. Um, so even in our ministry, we have almost 50% uh, diplomats are women, which is very interesting. We have, actually we just, uh, yesterday we had two women New woman uh, ambassador appointed one to France, one to Poland from UAE. So maybe in uh, Romania we'll have also a woman ambassador from UAE soon or so. So, uh, and almost 30% of our uh, ministers, our cabinet is made up uh, of women also. We have uh, a minister for youth. Again, youth is a very important, you know, I, I, I didn't maybe talk about it much, but it, she's also, it's a lady, she was the, one of the youngest ministers in the world that she's talking, uh, she's trying to, to get the youth voice heard in our government as much as possible. Uh, we even have 24 judges in our courts, women, you know, very interesting in, in our part of the world. So, yeah, we talked about space agency, again, uh, uh, Sarah Al Amiri, she is the, uh, the hope probe uh, head. I'll go faster. Humanitarian aid, of course, UAE is actually per capita probably the, the highest uh, in the world, you know, even more than the Scandinavian countries. Uh, so it's very interesting. We've been helping, you know, throughout. Uh, I, I always say from the most eastern part of the world to the, less, to the farthest west, uh, you see United Arab Emirates there. We even have actually international humanitarian city based in Dubai where uh, it makes it easier for UN, like World Food Program and all, to provide aid around the world because our logistics is so good, you know, and that becomes again part of the networking that we say, cultural diplomacy, being part of the global community. This is the UAE. And you can see the numbers here. There's been millions and millions that UAE has contributed to the world and we, we still continue. With Corona, again, UAE was, uh, in a way, a star, I would say. Right now, in terms of vaccination, we are number one in the world. We are ahead of uh, Israel and ahead of the other countries, when you read in the news. Uh, but also, we've been looking into our responsibility towards the world. So Emirates Airlines, because flight passengers' flights stopped, was using its flights for cargo and sending cargo to to over 100 countries around the world, helping them even with um, um, equipment and all for medical equipment during the pandemic uh, time. So, yeah, this is just to continue on that, you know. Uh, we've done a lot of medical flights. Actually, mobile hospitals we've, we've, we've set up in Sudan, Guinea-Conakry, Mauritania, and Jordan. These are just some examples that we have built there during the pandemic time. 
um, sustainability, of course, UAE, yeah. And here's also a question that people say, you have a lot of oil, you don't need to have any other sources of energy. But we always say that, and this is again from our, you know, our founder, uh, that we said that we want to celebrate the day that we are going to produce the last barrel of oil, not to cry. So for that, we need to build other alternatives. And we are using the resources that we are getting to build into other energy sources and uh, being a responsible country, if you will, to the world. You know, this is just an example. Uh, in Dubai, we are building one of the biggest solar uh, energy parks uh, with which will support millions by 2030, uh, millions of uh, million homes. Okay, so what is there for the future? Um, yeah, well, this is actually the Museum of the Future, <laughs> the, the example. It's already finished just about two weeks ago, a beautiful piece of architecture. Um, what I would like to say is that UAE, again, feels that it is important to share its experience, but to share also uh, the, the successes that it has with the others, but also the failures, you know, if possible, uh, to be a, a positive member and try to take uh, maybe some courageous moves because our region needs someone to take a, a courageous step. And UAE is trying to do that. Now, um, we can talk politics if you want after this, but uh, it is uh, our region, I think, I always say you are never bored in Middle East. You know, there's always something happening somewhere. So it's always exciting. Um, so, so it keeps you busy. So, and um, this is it, this is, this is the values. I mean, I don't know if you saw the ambition, you know, having an ambition and working on it, but also being tolerant, being accepting uh, to the others. And of course, having a vision, you know, coming from Citibank, we always used to have this you know, looking at vision and mission and what we want to do into the future for our company. Countries can do the same thing. And this is what we are, um, this was the message. The world is not enough, so going to the Mars, uh, which is actually makes a lot of sense as we read more about the space industry. And so 50 years and fabulous. Thank you very much. Okay. Do we have? <laughs> so it's as always, if you could briefly raise your hand, and then once I call on you, briefly introduce yourself so we know also where you're coming from. I think that's interesting for us all. Also, for some of us to get to know each other, since we've only met each other virtually in some cases. So please, ladies first. Um, Hi. Is it okay if I become master? Sure. No, it's okay, definitely. Um, I'm okay with that. <laughs> but, uh, uh, no, but thank yeah. you so much. Mm -hmm. um, I'm a student of economics, and yeah. uh, just like you, but oh. how, yeah, however, uh, I didn't go to London School of Economics, but um, mm -hmm. uh, one of the most important things about India is that it's so homogenous, and it, I feel like if contradictions had to be ever reconciled, they reconciled in India, because True. we are so different, even with within the same languages, we speak like 10 dialects. Yeah. And you are united and you welcome new people mm -hmm. to your cultures. And you said 85% of your population is African people from other parts of the world. True. But uh, what I'm just really curious about is, um, you know, when newer people start coming in, like local identities tend to feel and then mm -hmm. they feel like, okay, we might not be able to sustain this culture or this tradition because sure. newer people are coming in and they're bringing in their language and everything. Sure. So um, do you think globally we'll lose languages or that we because, you know, it's becoming so fluent. So you think, yeah, so what you're saying, are you saying that English probably is taking over maybe yeah. when we do internet and all this? Yeah, uh, you know, it depends. I think really UAE probably is an example of uh, having your identity, but not insisting on it in a way to say, this is the only way it should be. And I can give you an example. I mean, maybe we talk about some sensitive uh, areas also, for instance, in my country, uh, whether you want to you know, uh, be covered or not covered uh, as a Muslim or as a person, whoever, 
it, it's not an issue. It's never an issue. For instance, in my family, I have a lot of people who are covered from my sisters, you know? But it's, you know, if you insist on it, like other countries probably, when they do that, just to say because we want to keep our identity, the world has is, is become a, a global village now. I mean, you know this, because you know on social media, there is no more the world that we talked about before. It doesn't take you long to get from Germany to uh, Guinea or, or any other country or South America or something, you know? So you cannot, this is how time is going on. So you need to know how to live with it. So you can, you can have it within your own family, your own community if you want and all, but you cannot avoid others from coming in. Either you say then I'll close down, nobody comes into my country and I'll be isolated and you wither away, or no, I accept the others, but I will also celebrate my identity. And this is exactly what happens in, in my country. You know, as you saw some of the pictures, you saw, you know, uh, the local t traditional dress uh, th that the men wear, for instance, you know, Abdullah, my colleague, here he's not wearing it, but in, in, uh, in UAE he will wear it, for instance, right? So, because we celebrate that, that's nothing. So I think even for, for India, for instance, and other countries, India is so rich in culture and all. How can you even stop India from having all this cultural richness, you know? It will not finish. So it's a war that you will never win because uh, science will not allow you to win that. I mean, technology, the way the world is going. So you cannot just be in your own place anymore. So you have to accept the differences. But you have to also be proud of your past. I mean, and this is what we do all the time. We are very proud of our origin, our place, but so does everybody, I mean, you know, everyone else also. So we, we realize that. The same way that I am proud of my origin, uh, someone from Suriname, let's say, who comes to UAE, is very proud of his country, you know? So, and, and that is why the expo is going to be am amazing because this is the first time you have countries like Suriname. I know Suriname. A lot of people in, in, my, uh, in, in the world, when you say Suriname, they don't know where it is, for instance, right? Because I was in Brazil, I was non-resident to Suriname. So I had to go to Suriname, for instance, you know? Very interesting cultural country, actually. A lot of different cultures there. Um, they get a chance now to showcase Suriname to the world in Dubai, you know? And, and that is, you know, we always say we have to celebrate the diversity of, of people, diversity in religion, in race, in background, in colors, you know. And so I don't think we will lose it out, but there will be challenges. You need to work on it. I understand. And we did go through this period because when we started having schools and all, we had very strong Arabic, you know, but right now I see more private schools are going towards English. So Arabic is not being taught as much as it used to be in some of the private schools and all. It becomes a challenge. So the government's role is always to balance this. And you cannot do it by just forcing, you know, stopping something. You have to just incentivize. I mean, you've done economics, so, you know, it's all about incentives. So if I don't have an incentive to do something, I will not do it, you know? So you need to incentivize people to do the right things by putting those values. Uh, and, and that is, I think that is one of the secrets of UAE giving incentives for people to celebrate. So for instance, Holi, you know, the, the festival of Holi. In Dubai, in Abu Dhabi, Sharjah, all the differences, when it is the time, you see people celebrating that on the streets with all the colors and the paint, you know? And they enjoy it, they love it, because maybe it's something I don't do, but, you know, we have a big community people, and people get to know about the other culture. So instead of looking at the subject saying, you know, I will lose, say maybe I will gain more by showing what I have. So I don't know if this answers. But yeah, thank, you. thank you. Thank you. Pleasure. Mm -hmm. uh, in your presentation, which I love so much, I was 
find how can you find a negative between the more or less like um, corruption yep. where you move from mm-hmm. economic misappropriation of funds sure. resources these are things that are you know outside the development of my region and where we come from because we have all the resources gold etc diamond bauxite etc but for it to be used there's still issues of corruption and all these things that so I guess I want to understand what the mm-hmm. the real legal difference because I was finding it hard finding any of those elements mm-hmm. representation and how do countries in my region yep. learn from the model sure. and how to move as a forward producer. Thank you very much, Michael. Thanks for this question. It is an important point. And if you look at global index on corruption, you see UAE, one of the top countries with least corruption. But as you rightly said, because if there is so much oil and resources, a very small population, it's a good you know, uh, area for, for corruption to increase, you know, for people to misappropriate funds and all. Uh, I'm not saying it doesn't happen. It happens in UAE. It happens everywhere else. And we see that uh, coming out all over the world, right? But what we have is that we have put institutions. And that is very important. And this is something that, you know, when we look at developmental economics, is missing in our part of the world. You don't have this continuity of institutions. And I think this is what is done so well for, for the West, for, for Europe and all. You have rules and laws, and you have independent institutions that are there that are functioning well, and that make sure that things are going right. So putting that in place takes, it's very difficult to do it, but once you have it, it makes your life easy, you know? But you need to have the willingness to get to that. And, uh, and I think, again, in our part of the world, leadership becomes important. You know, another example is maybe Singapore. Singapore also started in in 50s or something like that, right? And they had Lee Kuan Yew as their leader. Uh, Again, very strong leader, but it was important. But he was also very uh, selfless. So he built Singapore into the powerhouse that it is today. It was a very poor place also. Actually, Singapore doesn't even have resources, if you think about it. So only the people are the resources. It's their brain, it's their, you know? Switzerland maybe is another good example also to put into these kind of areas. So UAE really believed in that. And that's why the founder, our founder, Sheikh Zayed, worked on the education, providing. And it became a national drive. I can give you an example. You know, it was illit- eradicating illiteracy was so important in my country when I was young. I was a child when I was going to school, grade one or two. I remember we used to go in the morning with the bus they used to come and take us. And they used to even give us sandwiches so to have food, something to eat in the school. So we, we like to go to school you know, as children. In the afternoon, my aunt, who was 50 or something, a lot older than I am, who was illiterate, she and the woman of the community used to go in the same bus to the same school. And in the evening, we used to sit together and do our homework. So it was, uh, you know. I was like, I don't know, 10, 12, whatever years, and then with someone who was 50 years. Mm-hmm. So, so eradicating illiteracy became so important that everybody was going for it. So that made us aware of the situation. You know? And then why do you get corruption, I guess? You know? I mean, so many reasons, of course. But one is that you don't see opportunities. There are no opportunities other than going through a route of corruption, maybe or uh, you know, bribery and all these other things that people say in our part of the world. But when you are educated, when you are well-educated, and you have a system that has already you know, appreciates that, gives you the opportunity, there's no reason to be corrupted you know, or to take that in, in place. So getting the administration of a country, the governance right, becomes very important. And looking at the government to be there to serve the people, and this you don't hear much in, in, in our part of the world. In, my, in our part of the world, if you are the president, you think that everybody else should serve you as a president. In UAE, it's the other way. Our prime minister, the ruler of Dubai, he says, our job is to serve our customers. You know, who are our customers? Are all the people who are living in Dubai, UAE nationals or others, to provide services to them. And, and that, is, that is the key. So the attitude 
towards this. And um, also having, of course, a strong rule of law and, you know, of course, uh, in place, that becomes uh, helpful. Uh, we do a lot of these uh, sessions with many countries uh, in, in our region where we talk about what we do and people come from different countries to see how we do our governance and, you know, our system is there. That can be an interesting area to, to have discussions. Hopefully, Expo will give us a chance to do that, maybe. Okay. Uh, your experience is a unique one that you have seen through the uh, transition of the years <laughs> to the UAE. Mm -hmm. So you've experienced those all three. Yeah. On Guy's, on uh, uh, Chef Guy's uh, role mm -hmm. in transition, can you tell us how, like, why the UAE was successful in being so much open yet preserving the values? The values. Sure. Yeah, again, really, I think, uh, you know, Sheikh Zayed, the uh, late Sheikh Zayed, uh, he was really very wise. And actually, when he was uh, young, he was, uh, I can tell you a story, he was ruling Alain. Alain is a city in, in Abu Dhabi. It's a smaller town, oasis town, actually. And uh, um, he was ruling that place. And uh, we had very strong child mortality because the health care was terrible. You know, that, that is in 50s, actually, 40s and 50s. There were mercenaries that came from Canada. So it was a family, a doctor and his wife, and they were treating the children. But a lot of people in, that, in the city, because it was a small tribal area, you know, said we are not going to ch take our children to, to the mercenary because you know, he's not Muslim, I don't know what, maybe I don't know what they're doing, you know, and stuff. So, but Sheikh Zayed, what he said, he said, no, if this is going to save my children, I don't care if he is Christian or not Christian. It's, that is not the, what is the goal? The goal is to preserve life and to build a better, you know? So that is the wisdom that comes in. And that is a time where he was not even, you know, his young years, as I said, his education was very limited. So what allowed us to work is to accept, you know, the other, to be open to the other as much as possible. If it is for the, community good and that becomes more important so you do things even if if i personally might not agree with his belief let's say but if this is going to help us as a community let's so that is the start and then you put this in everything you do so when you work so i worked in citibank right we're talking we had so many colleagues from all over the world working there I couldn't say, oh, I'm special because I'm a UAE citizen. I can do whatever I want. I don't go to work or I get from. No, I was getting the same evaluation, you know, uh, criteria like everybody else. And the government never came and said, oh, no, because she's a UAE national. Citibank, you have to promote her or, you, you know, you don't. No, never interferes. Very important to have this. So you need to know your limits. You need to know why, what is the purpose of you being there? the bigger picture and that is always i think it's been a key for us in uae we always look at that even right now when we talk about de-escalation in our region not to have more tension we are really going to work for that now this will be the message for the future opening up to the world to the region even if they they think otherwise even if they were not fair to us because you can find anything in history if you go back you know the americans can always say, you know, uh, the original people in America can always say the Europeans who came 200 years ago, they were not fair to them of what happened. It will never finish otherwise, you know, if you continue going into that kind of cycle. The key is to say, yes, injustice has happened, but let us find out going forward, what about our future? What about, why do we always look backward? Let's look forward, you know, and that is, that mindset change is the problem in our part. We are always looking back. We're never looking at the, the next, what about our children, our children's children? And this is, I think, the, what UAE has maybe put as a point. Okay. It's okay.
Your yeah. Excellency, uh, there are many more questions. Uh, if you just why don't we maybe conclude the formal parts for now, okay. and then maybe in the reception afterwards, we'll have a chance also one on one to come sure. to you, and I'm sure we can continue the dialogue in, in many ways. But first of all, to express our sincere gratitude uh, to the ambassador for an excellent presentation. Yeah. 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 Yeah.